Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical-ish. This is the eighth episode in the Ancient Mysteries Iceberg, where we'll be going over the second half of the fourth tier. If you haven't seen any of the previous episodes, make sure you go check out the playlist on my channel page, or you can click this tag right above. Anyways, let's jump right in. Number 11, the Lost Labyrinth of Egypt. The Lost Labyrinth was built outside the Pyramid of Hawara and was one of the most visited sites in the ancient world. The labyrinth had over 3,000 rooms which were filled with hieroglyphs and other paintings on each wall. This structure is documented by our favorite and most reliable historian, Herodotus, as well as a few other ancient writers. It's believed that the structure held the keys to all of human history within the artwork that was depicted on each wall. Herodotus states that the labyrinth was situated a little above the Lake of Moiris and nearly opposite to that which is called the City of Crocodiles. When one had entered the sacred enclosure, one found a temple surrounded by columns, 42 each side, and this building had a roof made of a single stone, carved with panels and richly adorned with excellent paintings. It contained memorials of the homeland of each of the kings, as well as the temples and sacrifices carried out within it, all skillfully worked in paintings of the greatest beauty. What's interesting is that a structure this large and this visited was just lost to time and buried beneath the sands. It remained a legend just written about by Herodotus and other writers until the late 1800s when Flinders Petrie found the remains of a huge stone foundation buried four meters beneath the sand that was 300 meters wide. He claims that this was the remnants of the foundations for the labyrinth, with the structure itself being destroyed and quarried for different uses around Egypt. Other archaeologists uncovered some of the site, but it was immediately shut down by the Egyptian authorities. In 2008, new evidence was collected and began to challenge the conclusion of Petri that said that this was the foundation. This new evidence states that instead of the foundation, it was actually part of the ceiling or roof. Herodotus notes that there was one singular stone that took up the entire roof, and since they found a single piece of stone, you could point to the fact that this was the ceiling that other ancient historians claim to have seen. Along with that and the radar findings of tunnels and massive grid-like patterns underneath the stone, it looks like the Egyptian government is covering up the discovery and preventing the stories and mysteries of the labyrinth from the people. Which, there are also many theories on why the Egyptian authorities are covering up so many different sites, just like the tunnels under the Sphinx, and one of those is that the sites would reveal that the ancient or dynastic Egyptians were not the creators of them, or even the original inhabitants of the area. Maybe the Egyptian authorities are just protecting the historical significance of the ancient Egyptians, but we'll really never know the truth behind this labyrinth until the Egyptian authorities allow excavations to continue on the project. Number 12, the Tullenmand and other bog bodies. On May 6, 1950, Vigo and Emil Hodgard, along with Vigo's wife Greeth, were working in Bildsvodkal bog collecting peat when they uncovered a body of a man. All the man had on was a belt and cap made of skin, as well as a leather strap wrapped around his neck. What's wild about this is the man was buried, basically mummified, but preserved so well in the mud that it looks like he was a recent murder. This can happen once all the oxygen is taken away from the body. Y'all should look up the mass mammoth grave sites in North America, which date to the Younger Dryas event. But both these grave sites show similar features because of the lack of oxygen and very thick mud that can preserve animals or people for a long time. Anyways, they actually did an autopsy on him and his brain and other organs like his intestines which were all intact, which is a pretty wild for a body that old. And the Tullin man isn't the only bog body found. There are a lot of others found all over Northern Europe, being in Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, England, and Ireland, with the oldest known body dating back to 2000 BC. Another detail that adds to the mystery is he seems to be smiling, but researchers believe he was ritually sacrificed or murdered, which would make you wonder why in fact he was smiling. They also haven't been able to pull any DNA from the body, so we don't know exactly where this man was from or lived either. This as well as the many other bog bodies found range in dating over thousands of years, which leaves the mystery of why these bodies were buried here. Ritual sacrifice, punishment, we may never know truly until we first learn more about the societies in which these people came from. 13. Mystery of the Varna Gold between 1972 and 1991, 13 pounds of gold were excavated from a cemetery containing 312 graves in Varna, Bulgaria. These golden objects include bangles, pendants, discs, armor, and many other gold inlaid objects. These objects found in these graves date back to 6,500 years ago and has upended the long-held beliefs about prehistoric societies. Originally, the people of the Copper Age were thought to be small groups with a matriarchal structure, but this grave site tells a different story. The richest graves were male, 
the chiefs were male, and in general shows that this was in fact a male-dominated society. One in five of the 312 graves contained small gold objects, and only four contained 75% of the total gold uncovered. Since they were only found in a handful of the graves, suggesting social status, which according to scientists would be the oldest known representation of this. Which this is in fact pretty ironic given the fact that the communist leadership promoted the site, even though it was pretty evident that even in the 5th century BC, society was still stratified, which is the exact opposite of their ideology. People of the time were able to focus less on survival due to the abundance of food, and specialize in different areas such as metalworking, showing an advance in society. Then the true underlying mystery occurred. This all came to an abrupt end around 4000 BC. Settlements were abandoned, and there is not evidence of people to fill the gaps. Some scholars believe it was due to the invasion of Indo-Europeans, although no signs of battle or violence has ever been found. Another more recent theory is that, of course, it was the changing climate of the time which caused the villages to be swallowed up by the rising sea levels of the Black Sea. People are still searching for answers, but this gap in history is definitely an interesting one. Number 14, where did the Sumerians come from? We've already covered the Anunnaki and their connections with the Sumerians, but a more in-depth study of ancestral DNA and local legend has been researched by historians. The area of southern Mesopotamia has been inhabited since ancient times, and the present-day inhabitants, the Marsh Arabs, are considered the people with a direct tie to the Sumerians of the ancient world. In tradition, however, the Marsh Arabs are considered a foreign people with an unknown origin who arrived with the introduction of the water buffalo. But tests done with the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome indicate that we have records of people before the Sumerians. But there's no way to identify them because we have no artifacts or written languages as the Sumerians were the first, according to our knowledge, to develop such. But even though we find ancestors older than them, there's no statistically significant data that suggests that they weren't from the area. So we've got a little bit of a contradiction between legends and reality, but only a contradiction if we are underestimating how old the civilization really was. We only have records that we know of, and obviously that doesn't mean stuff existed before our discoveries. So if they are older than we think, then the legend may be true, we just don't have any evidence yet to support it. Number 15, the Karnak Stones. Outside the village of Karnak, France, there are roughly 4,000 prehistoric stones that are perfectly lined up in a series of fields. These stone lines stretch to almost a mile in length, and each individual stone can range from 1 to 4 meters in height, and can be dated between 4500 BC and 3300 BC. There are some pretty funny legends about these stones since little is known about their construction or purpose. Local lore believe that the stones to be that of a Roman army turned to stone by someone near and dear to my heart. Merlin the Wizard. Another legend is that this was an army of pagans that was turned to stone by Pope Cornelius. A lot of analysis has been done on astronomical alignments of the stones, how they align with sunsets, or even the solstices, but these are all heavily debated. One theory that I thought was pretty interesting was that if mapped out by connecting two stones to a bearing, they can point towards significant landmarks such as Edinburgh, Scotland, and Stonehenge, both of which were significant to the Celts. They also possibly point to other significant natural landmarks around the globe. If this theory is true, then it would show that the culture that created Stonehenge and Karnak were related, and that the world was traveled and mapped using geometry long before what is accepted by modern academia. Number 16, Kofun. Kofun are ancient Japanese burial sites for nobility, royalty, and emperors. There are over 160,000 of them, and they all have a distinct keyhole shape that isn't found anywhere else on earth. Some are even bigger land-wise than the pyramids of Egypt. It's believed that the site started as a circular mound surrounded by moats, but because that is difficult to maintain and observe, land bridges were constructed making the keyhole shape which became tradition. Japanese legend says that the emperor first came from the sky as many other nations who have royalty who claim they have divine blood. They believe the royal family were descendants from the gods, and there's a theory that suggests that making the keyhole mounds or memorials was a way for the gods to find their blood, as they are only visible from high in the air. In 2016, there was actually a keyhole-shaped mound found on Mars, too. There's most likely not a connection here, but if the gods did come from another place, then you've got some pretty interesting stuff that you're looking at. Number 17, Rupkund. In 1942, an Indian official came across Rupkund Lake, which held between 300 and 800 human remains, that were preserved by the freezing temperatures. Originally, the remains were thought to be from Japanese soldiers or Tibetan traders on the Silk Road who died from exposure to the elements. 
but after a study in 2004, it's theorized that this was a group of Indian pilgrims who could have been struck by a hailstorm due to the injuries on their skulls. A once-in-a-12-year Hindu pilgrimage to Hamkun, known as Nara Devi Rajjat Yatra, could be the possible explanation of why so many people are at this site, as this lake is on the way to Hamkun. And since no weapons of any kind were found, they can reasonably conclude that they were not soldiers. This was the most widely accepted theory until 2019, where the results of a five-year study were published. They found that 38 of the skeletons belonged to three genetically distinct groups of people, and these groups of people were left here over multiple events over a 1,000-year period. The first group was South Asian, whose bones date to the 7th through 10th century. The second group was individuals from the island of Crete from the 19th century, and the last being the Southeast Asian origin, also in the 19th century. All of these findings were backed up by the dietary analysis done as well. Nobody really knows then why these groups of people were all at this remote lake and what their goal was. What I find so interesting about this story is that each time new evidence is found, it leaves significantly more questions than answers. Number 18, the Sivatherium of Kish. So a Sivatherium is an extinct genus of primordial giraffe that roamed Africa and the Indian subcontinent. It's believed to come about 7 million years ago in the late Miocene, and then most likely became extinct around 1 million years ago in the early Pleistocene. In the mid-1920s, a copper rain ring used to fit on the tongue of a chariot was found while excavating Kish, which was an ancient Sumerian city-state in Mesopotamia. It's dated to about 3500 BC, and while rain rings are a typical find for the time period, what's odd is the animal that's depicted. Usually the rings depict an animal that was used to draw the chariot, but this animal had horns crafted in a very unique way. Originally thought to be a stag Persian fallow deer, after closer examinations, the proportions don't line up, and the horns above the eyes are not known to be on the deer. Its proportions, as well as the horn structures, do, however, line up with reconstructions of the Civitherium, but how would this animal be around in 3500 BC when it was thought to go extinct roughly 1 million years ago? All of the rain rings that have been found previously have pretty good representations of the animals that they're depicting. So could this be an accurate depiction of a Civitherium who survived a lot longer than previously thought? Or is this just an inaccurate depiction of a fallow deer? Number 19, what's actually inside Chen Shuo Huang's tomb? On September 10th, 210 BC, Chen Shuo Huang died after conquering six warring states to create the first unified China and was buried in a tomb that is still unopened today. This was the most complex tomb structure ever created in China and is a massive collection of underground caverns that held everything the emperor would need in the afterlife. Ancient writings say that it was an entire underground kingdom with a ceiling that looked like the night sky with pearls used as stars. It's also thought that the tomb is surrounded by moats of liquid mercury which they thought would bring immortality. Which is also kind of funny because he took mercury pills so he could live longer when in reality this is probably what killed him. Some of the surrounding areas of the tomb have been uncovered, which house the well-known terracotta army, with estimates that there could be up to a total of 8,000 soldiers. When the terracotta soldiers were originally found, their paint would wear off almost immediately when exposed to the open air. They now have techniques that will allow them to preserve the paint on these terracotta soldiers. But this is a perfect example of one of the reasons why they haven't yet opened up the tomb. They claim they want to wait to open the tomb and excavate the rest of the area until they have sufficient excavation techniques that would allow them to do the least amount of damage. Unfortunately, due to the mercury as well as the Chinese government, the site remains protected and there haven't been any excavations on the main tomb. So there's no telling what actually lies within this tomb. And number 20, what was the set animal? Within the ancient Egyptian pantheon, there are many gods that are portrayed to have the heads of animals and all but one can be identified as a real animal. This mystery animal is known as the Set animal. Set is known to be the god of storms, disorder, deserts, violence, and chaos. And since the animals that depicted each god was used to represent their personality, we can assume that the Set animal was not a very friendly animal. A lot of Egyptologists claim that this was just an imaginary animal, but many people have tried to give evidence that the animal did in fact exist. Many times it's depicted as a canine-like body with a long downward curved nose, square ears, and an erect tail. When it's on the form of a human, the tail is still present, the ears are still present, and it still maintains that long downward curved nose. There have been many attempts to connect this animal to known species in the area like hyenas, jackals, wild dogs, 
but some theorize it could just be a combination of all the animals that were used to represent the god set. Or, just like the Civitherium, it could just be yet another species that was lost to time that the ancients depicted within their artwork. Well, that about wraps up Tier 4. If you have any questions or comments about any of the topics or theories discussed, don't forget to leave a comment. And if you have any topics that you would like me to cover in the future and dive deeper into, whether it's on this list or not, please leave a comment down below. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And to those that are subscribed, I appreciate you very much. It's been a lot of fun covering these topics. Anyways, I'll see you all next week. Thanks for watching.